the top of the hour. I'll keep admitting people, but it's all on you, my friends. Thank you and welcome everybody. Today is April 1st, 2021. Welcome to the New Possibilities Hour. We have a wonderful guest today, Laurel Bellows. The New Possibilities Hour is part of the Will Work for Food project, first organized by Natalie Armstrong Motan when the lockdown began in the spring of 2020. As you know, we don't charge for these great webinars. We ask you to contribute to food banks, either one recommended by our guest speaker or one of your choice if you like what you see. And so far in the roughly one year we've been doing these, our audiences, the alternative dispute resolution and litigation communities have been so generous fighting food insecurity it's one of the highlights of every installment of our webinar here when we announce the running total of how much money our wonderful audiences have contributed so far. So Gene Lawler, would you please uh, take it from here and tell us how we're doing? Uh, drum roll, please. Yes, as of today, as of right now, we are at uh, $95,885, getting up to that $100,000 mark, which I'm sure will will hit in a week or two. So fantastic. Thank you, everyone, and congratulations, and uh, such a generous group of people. Yes, thank you all. That's almost one million meals for people dealing with food insecurity. Thank you all so much. Today, we have a terrific guest, Laurel Bellows. She's managing principal of the Bellows Law Group PC. She's internationally recognized for her expertise in executive compensation. The Bellows Law Group offers pragmatic advice, transactional and commercial litigation services to corporate executives, entrepreneurs, companies of all sizes. Ms. Bellows counsels mid-level and senior executives and corporations on employment, severance, private equity and change and control agreements, internal investigations and business disputes. Laurel is also past president of the nearly 400,000 member American Bar Association which operates throughout the United States and 40 other countries. She's also been president of the Chicago Bar Association, the National Conference of Bar Presidents, the Chicago Network, and the International Women's Forum Chicago. She has also served on the global board of the International Women's Forum, where she founded and chaired its governance committee. Uh, Laurel holds a bachelor's degree from the University of Pennsylvania and a JD from Loyola University School of Law, Chicago. She's practiced, licensed to practice law in Illinois, California, and Florida, and is a certified mediator. Today, Laurel Bellows will be giving us 10 tips for effective negotiation, focusing on the employment and executive compensation arenas. Laurel, please tell us about the food bank that is important to you, to which you'd like people to contribute if they're able. And then we're looking forward to your presentation very much. The floor is yours. Thank you, Jeff. I'm so excited to be here. I just love this concept. And uh, what you just heard from Jean, right, is that we could go over the $100,000 mark today, depending on how generous you feel in those bones of yours. So if you're not hungry, somebody else on the street is absolutely in need of your donation. So let's see if we can just uh, pull forward. I'm going to tell you my, my favorite culinarycare.org, culinarycare.org, and of course the Chicago Food Depository. But the reason I have uh, my favorite culinarycare.org is founded by a young woman whose father died of lung cancer about eight years ago. And at the time that the diagnosis was made, it was a rapid decline. She understood that when people brought her family meals, uh, every night they were the family was able to work but then they were also able to come together without worrying and spend those last days together as a family it was such an amazing experience for her that she carries forward in her heart that she founded culinary care in chicago uh, in order to take care of those who are in active treatment uh, re receiving infusions at the hospital and they have, they are outpatients. So the hospitals don't generally give them food. So unless they have somebody who's able to take time off work or pack them a lunch or determine what they can eat on any given day, these people are 
right? Spending a whole day in, in infusion and active care without anything to eat at all and feeling on their own. If you've traveled to a city and uh, in order to get your care and you have no family, if you are poor or homeless and you can't afford to send somebody downstairs to the hospital commissary to buy you lunch, Colony Care takes your order and has developed relationships with people in Chicago, restaurants in Chicago, who without charge provide culinary care with meals and they take care of the pickup and the deliveries directly to somebody very personally, not just to drop off with a big smile that says, hey, we really care about you. And sometimes the person who's delivering offers to share that meal. It's a very wonderful personal experience. So if you can send what you can to culinarycare.org, but send to your own favorite food depository as well. All we want to do is see if we can't get close and over that $100,000 mark today. And so that's part of the beginning of my negotiation, right? It's my first ask. Um, and, it's, and it's thrilling to be here, Jeff, because we're sitting here um, with the master negotiator and mediator, and because that is what mediator is all about, to get a sense of the people and the goals and, and how to best bring to closure a dispute of any, any size, huge or small. Uh, so let's just jump right in. I have um, misrepresented. I told you that I was going to give you 10 pointers for successful negotiations, and you're going to get a lot more. So you can take out your pencils because I made a decision today that I was going to go without a PowerPoint. I want to talk to you as if I'm negotiating with you. I want to be looking you in the eye when I tell you some, some basics and some tips intermingled. The first tip is an imperative. It is not a tip. No one, master negotiator or novice, no one goes into a negotiation with having, without having prepared. And what I mean by prepared is prepare, 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 not just what your goals are, because we will speak about that, but what you, the other person on the other side of the table is like. What is that person's reputation in your community? Are they a hard driver? Are they credible? Do they do, they do what they say? Can you trust them? Will there be amicable negotiation or do they try to um, enter a negotiation in, in an aggressive format to take the control because they think that spitting and screaming wins the day. Right? You have to be prepared to know who is on the other side. And of course that might change. And you'd like also to know who's gonna be present for the other side to know if you've got a group coming from the other side. And the most important who's gonna be present is who has authority. Someone on the opposite side, someone from the group with whom you are negotiating or that individual with whom you're negotiating, you must be assured that they have authority to bring the matter you're discussing to closure. What I mean by that is very simple. Can they sign the dotted line today if I'm here negotiating with them? If they do sign an agreement, do they have the authority to do it? Of course, that would be taken care of in the agreement itself. It would say people who are signing represent that they have authority. But if we're just sitting and chatting and trying to work something out among the two of us, right up front, you need to figure out something that's a little bit more complicated than you would imagine. The authority to do what? The authority to agree to the deal that I want, or the authority to agree to the deal that you're asking for, which might be way different, right? Or the authority to come to a reasonable conclusion and that you have the authority to make the judgment whether that's reasonable. So to get there, you're gonna have some other, you're gonna ask some very specific questions just as a starter. And you could do this before the negotiation begins, that person to person, because guess what, folks? You're negotiating from the very first moment you talk to the person who's on the other side. And I say on the other side carefully, all right? Because really, you don't wanna think about them as opposing. You want to think about the person who, with whom you're negotiating as someone that's gonna to come together with you to find a reasonable solution to a joint problem. 
It's either your problem or it's your client's problem or it's your parent's problem or it's your children's problem. You could be negotiating with the coach of the water polo team to see why your daughter is, you know, was taken off practice yesterday because she scratched somebody instead, you know, she didn't follow the rules. All right. So you need to understand why you're there, of course, but you need to understand the reputation of the person who's sitting at the other side of the table is the way we would put it, not necessarily on the other side. So first, do they have the authority? Do they have to go to someone else for approval? Now that's an urgent question because often what happens as a ploy or a practicality, both a ploy or a practicality is the person with whom you're negotiating does the entire deal with you all the way to shaking hands and it says, Laurel, I'll be back to you in two days. I'll check with my board. Or, Laurel, this is a great deal. I'm very excited we've come to a conclusion, but my president has to approve. That is not having authority. And I think you can answer for yourself what happens in those situations. The negotiator who did not have authority takes our deal back to the board and the board tries to negotiate something better. Well, you should have done this and you should have done that. And why don't you go back and ask for this and ask for that? You don't want to go through this because the deal that you shake on is the deal that you should be receiving. No movement needed. So that's what I mean, at least a little clue as to the authority and the questions relating to it that is part of your preparation. The other part I suggested find out personally, you're gonna to have to make a whole bunch of calls. Do you know this lawyer? Do you know this business person? Do you know this teacher? Do you know this artist? What are they like? Um, is it possible? I saw a work of art at the art fair the other day and I really fell in love with it. Does that artist negotiate? Well, generally they don't, right? Generally they set a price, but if it's the end of the art fair or if there's a payment structure, or never walk into a negotiation with thinking that it's not gonna happen because everything really is negotiable. It's just the kind of questions you ask. And you know, if you're authentic about it, that, that artist, I, they saw my eyes open, right? I just like fell in love with that painting. Big mistake, of course, right? Big mistake, why? Well, think about this one, right? If you are house shopping and you're with your significant other and you walk into your dream house, What's going to be the worst thing you could do to negotiate that is say, oh, honey, this is the house. And there is standing the broker and there is standing the owner. And what have you done? No, you got to you got to be pleasant. All right. You have to have a default face um, wherever you're negotiating. It doesn't have to be a mean or serious face. I mean, that's you want to be an open face, but a pleasant face, which doesn't really change. So you're not giving away, you know, your needs and your desires. But if you went to that artist again and they saw that you loved it, then turn that into something important. Every artist, every person likes to know that they do something impressive. So when you're figuring out who these people are, figure out what that you're going to tell them about how wonderful, how much you respect them, how terrific they are as an expert. Right, because that's going to build confidence in the other side and it's going to, most importantly, build an immediate rapport. You're in the business of preparing to know all the facts in your case, to know everything about the other person's case, about where their alternatives might be and where your alternatives might be and how you might answer and respond to questions. But mostly what you're doing is you're preparing to be in a position to build trust and influence. Not the kind of influence that's pushy, do what I want influence. The kind of influence that opens your amygdala in your brain to say, all right, to the prefrontal cortex, let her in. And you do that by being open, by being, as I'm talking to you, this is me. All right, this isn't a fake person. I love people and I love what I do. And I negotiate, I'm passionate about negotiation. I do it every single day. And I love it because I'm negotiating on behalf of people who are in crisis. My, my clients, they're getting 
a severance. They've been told and they could be senior executives or they could be um, not entry level because that's not who I negotiate for, but they could be senior and junior managers. And yesterday they just got a surprise. It's COVID time, but even outside COVID time, there's, there's reasons why somebody, an employer has to say goodbye. So they get a surprise. They come to me. How do they feel? It's important that I know how my client feels. It's important that I understand how the corporation or the employer that I'm negotiating with feels. I mean, feels really emotional intelligence, not what are they thinking, but what are they feeling? Because the questions I'm gonna ask them are more, how do you feel about this proposal? You know, you've given me, you've given me an opportunity to, um, have three months of, of severance, you know, but you've asked for me not to compete with you, not to join another entity that competes with you for a year. Now, how can I go without a year of food, all right, for three months of severance? I can't, I have a family. So let's figure out what the alternatives are. Let's together work this out. Now, what is the beginning goal of any negotiation? That goal is, to come together and find a solution to a problem. That goal, people talk about win-win. I, I really don't use those terms. I might think, how can I bring this matter to amicable, and if not amicable, at least reasonable closure? That's a goal. And that agreement that I'm seeking to reach either on behalf of somebody else or for myself, I want that agreement to endure. I want it to be reasonable enough on both sides that both sides have the incentive to abide by the deal. We all know that lawyers or other people all right, can break contracts. We all know that sometimes you have to break a contract. You can't, you can't deliver, there's COVID and you have no way of delivering your goods tomorrow as your contract indicated you could. The roads are closed. You, you can't get through because LA shut down, all right? The, you, there, are, there are things that make it impossible to perform. But the, what I'm talking about is that you've negotiated such a tough deal such a killer deal that at the end of the day, after that agreement is signed, your counterpart on the other side can't afford to buy the supplies necessary to manufacture what you purchased and send them in time to meet the deadline on your deal. So you should be always understanding that your deal needs to be durable. If this is a long-term relationship. You need to think about it as to making a deal that will ad adhere in a long-term way so that everybody will be glad to come back to the table and negotiate the next opportunity, the next manufacturing of something that you're interested in. You wanna make certain if it's a short-term or if it's a one-off, that you don't take advantage of that one-off, that you do the best deal possible even if you're never going to see that person again, walking down the streets in Hong Kong and seeing a vase that you can't live without, right? But you don't know if it's real or antique and you don't know anything, anything at all about the shopkeeper. All you can do is walk in and start to use some questioning negotiating techniques about what they say it is. And I will share with you in a little bit what listening means but listening in addition to preparation is probably the best tip that I will give you today. So now I'm saying define the goal of the negotiation, relationship building, enduring agreement, something that the other side and you can perform and something that manages and increases and does not, uh, there is no detriment to your reputation because your reputation is everything. And don't you think for a minute that the people who listen to me and to others who speak about negotiation haven't gone out into the community and made their 10 calls to figure out what you're like. Your credibility before you walk in the door is this gold halo, all right, that, wa that walks over you so that there's already an authenticity and a trust built in. 
because sometimes you don't have the time to build long-term trust. You simply have the time to build immediate trust. And if that's the case, you better make sure that your word is your bond everywhere, every moment of your life, because that word is going to what be what most of your life depends on going forward. And it's something that in negotiation, you should teach your children and your family, as well as your teammates, your employees, and you know, a little bit of managing up to your employers to get to the very top. Your CEO, your word needs to be your bond to every employee in the business. So that's defining the goal of the negotiation. Preparation, you're in a gathering information mode. If you're making one or two calls and you're reading all your documents, that's not it. Preparation, I often spend an hour when I'm left lecturing on what preparation consists of. So what kind of information are you gathering? Is this a business negotiation? Why is the other person or entity at the table? Do they need money? Is it an immediate need of money? Are they, are they going bankrupt or they have a loan due? Do they have a deadline? Do they have an agreement which is coming to fruition where they have to deliver something and you are the local supplier who can deliver it, something happened. So is there an urgency to the need of the person on the other side? That's, and what, and you have to look in the mirror and say, and what is my deadline? What are my needs? What are my goals and how do they match? So you have to go that step further. It's not just gathering information about the people you're gonna negotiate with. It's, it's gathering the information in your brain and taking the time to let your brain work out how your needs and their needs can come together. And on that subject, as you're gathering information, where's that information going? Well, I know you're putting it in files and maybe a ton of lists, so that's fine. And then you're going to um, do what you think you do best, which is take those thousands of pieces of paper and lists and thoughts, because you're, as you're preparing, you're getting side thoughts in and you're writing them down. And you're gonna hone that list down to priorities. So you're gonna gather information and then you're gonna use this information to establish your priorities. What kind of priorities do I mean? I mean, two kinds of priorities. The priority about what's most important to you and what your second and third and fourth choice might be and what combination of alternatives would make your deal the best for you. That's priority and we'll talk about best alternative, but there is the priority of the manner in which you're neg negotiating. Which of your many issues do you want to put on the table first? Please remember that your opposite number is doing the same thing, all right? They are preparing their own agenda and they are seeking to control that agenda in a way that they think works best for them. We all talk about whether you wanna negotiate the hard and big issues first, all right? And then, um, and then the little ones later, or start with the little ones and build a pattern of yes, yes, yes. So it's a lot easier. You've built a little bit of rapport when you get to the tough ones, or you wanna start a little light and then shoot in one of the ones that's really hard. You know, it could be price, it could be delivery, it could be the wares geographically, it could be whatever is the most difficult, or it could be a solution to the emotional problem between two people that is really not about the negotiation of the thing, but is about the relationship, brother, sister, family succession, many items that are really largely emotional, or somebody broke a deal and broke their word. And though we're negotiating the payment for that, and we want, and it would be nice if we could just limit this to dollars and cents and not to an airing of all grievances, all right? That doesn't happen because either inner or outer, inside or out, expressed by anger or sadness or um, even tears, you know, a very emotional response, or everything's inside and you can't tell, except that you know there's something going on that is building a barrier to a decisive and agreeable and supportable uh, solution. So you're going to know your opposition as well, all right? And that is call brokers, real estate brokers, call your friends who are bankers, call stock brokers. They can't give you personal information, but the world is small. 
and they will be able, someone in the group of 25 calls that you make are gonna be able to give you something personal about the people. Now I'm not talking about necessarily the person on the other side, if you are negotiating through an intermediary or, or through a lawyer, but to give you information about the person behind that lawyer as well. Now you also need to know about that lawyer at the table. Now, we, you know, where is their mind when this comes? Are they willing to be flexible and open-minded? Are they creative or do you have to be creative for them? So you need to really know your opposition. And I've spent a lot of time on that uh, right now, but it's, I can't emphasize enough how important it is to be prepared at all levels. And the next portion is to do something you might not do with attention either. I want you to visualize your deal. Visualize your dream agreement. Write it down, not in legalese. Write it down. This is what I'm looking for. I agree to do X and Y and Z, and I would like the other side to agree to do X and Y and Z. And then I want you to literally visualize the day after the negotiation has reached agreement along your dream terms. Now, those dream terms are never coming to fruition. But if you visualize the office you're going to be sitting in, the team that, and resources that you've requested, if you visualize whether there are enough windows, if you visualize whether they're permitted a plant in the door, if you decide whether you're going to be on the executive floor or asked to be down in the midst of your team, if the, if the employer that you're negotiating with has open office space and you're used to your own space and it's a little tiny office, all right, or a noisy space and you're used to quiet and need to concentrate, you need to figure out if this is the deal for you. But it's not just about the numbers. It's about how you're going to feel with the resources you've negotiated to receive. When you're positioned for success, are you feeling that you can achieve success? And what does that dream say? So it includes your budget, it includes your resources, it includes the people who might be on your team. It includes the ability to build your own team or to accept somebody else's team. It includes the ability to negotiate your goals for your bonus. It doesn't matter what level you are. When are you gonna review my next, uh, when, when do you review my performance? Sometimes they say not for a year. So one of your dream you know, requests could easily be, I would like to be reviewed in three months. I'd like to be reviewed every three months for the first year. That's not giving up any time. That's not giving up any money. It's a very reasonable request. And employers are doing that more often, but rarely do people actually ask for that unless they're asking for an increase so that they would like to accept this money right today, but they'd like to be reviewed for competence and confidence and, and achievements in, in sooner than a year. There, you can ask for anything but visualize your deal. Now, I'd like to talk to you about building trust. So women often think about the fact that they aren't great negotiators. I hear this all the time from women. Men, listen up, because I'm about to give you some clues as to how a woman negotiates, right? So women don't generally have confidence in how they negotiate. They think that um, they're, they're not going to be able to reach a deal. And they think that they're not going to be able to uh, reach a great deal. The fact is that women are superior negotiators because we are relationship builders. And negotiating is all about building trust and building relationships, even in a short period of time. The reason women don't like to negotiate is, generally speaking, except some of us who eat conflict for breakfast, right? But the reason women don't like to negotiate is because there is a conflict, a disagreement. If there weren't a disagreement, you wouldn't be negotiating. You'd be having a cup of coffee together. So every negotiation involves some form of disagreement. Some of them, as I said, simple, just like what time are we going to dinner? Or some of them are, some of them are very, very emotional or some of them are built after years and years and years, 40, 50 years of living a particular way with family and having to deal with who's gonna inherit the business. I mean, there, there are 
there are all kinds of levels, but you need to figure out that that conflict is something you can resolve and not be afraid of. It will not destroy your relationships. You're used to building relationships, friends, and I'm used to telling you that you ought to not be in fear of negotiating in any way you want, okay, that gets you to an agreement that is doable and reasonable for both of you. So women, get past the conflict part. Breathe deeply, do those power women poses before you come in. Excuse yourself if you're a little concerned about the way things are happening. There's nothing, there's, you know, and by power woman poses, I'm talking to men and women, but only women are really taught to do this, right? You just, before you go in and you say, oh, you don't enter the door, you say, big deep breath, you know, arms there or arms out, superwoman pose. I've got this. I've got it, right? Go. I've never seen a man outside the door do anything like that. I don't know why not, actually, because it's energizing, right? And they're not going out to hurt anybody. You're just saying, Laurel, you've got all the facts. You know where you want to be. You know the people. You're totally prepared. And you're going to bring something home for your friend, your client, your family that is really, really meaningful. So how about that, right? Next, men. Deep breathing is a very important factor, particularly if you're losing it. Now, if you're losing your temper or your patience, and the thing about negotiation is patience is everything. Patience is everything. I cannot teach you to be a patient person. I can just give you a tip. Breathe and listen. So when I say listen, I mean look right into Jeff's eyes, put all your body movement aside, don't freeze, and focus. What is Jeff saying to me? What are the words that he's using? What is the tone that he's using? Are his eyes wandering? Is he lying to me perhaps? But don't get too involved because you're not an expert to determine whether somebody's lying or maybe you are and all the better, all right? But then you'd have to decide with me what you're gonna do about it once you find out that they're lying because you're probably not gonna call them out on it immediately. Focus. You are not, as everybody tells you, but it's really hard. You are not listening to Jeff in order to decide what to say to what he's saying. You are not planning your next remarks. Why? Because if you're thinking here about what you're gonna say to him, you are not listening to Jeff. Jeff is giving you all kinds of clues, conscious and subconscious, about what's important to him, his client, his family. He's telling you by the tone and the, and the emotion on his face, unless he keeps that lovely, pleasant default face that you all are gonna practice in the mirror every day and resort to it every day. Just like your mom, you know, hits you in the forehead to say, stop frowning so you won't have, so you won't have wrinkles. I know guys, that probably didn't happen to you either, but think about that. Just kind of go, you want that default, pleasant, calm face somebody loses it, you're going to test. Either it is a ploy to unnerve you, to defocus you to something else, to try and push you someplace because they're being unpleasant and unreasonable, and your choices vary. Here's one of the best. And we're left um, pins and needles waiting for that uh, best. Right? And the first one to talk gives something away, right? So silence, I love you for that. You were just so perfect. We couldn't have rehearsed it better. Ladies and gentlemen, that silence was only 10 seconds, 10 seconds. If it were me, I use silence a lot. And men, you use it more than you think. And it's a tremendously effective tool. Rather than break the silence, ladies, all right, because ladies break silence and they negotiate against themselves. The man is silent and they think that the proposal they put on the table is either so outrageous or the guy has gone to sleep or he's so angry he's not responding. So the woman says, oh, well, if you don't like that, we could do X. Silence is one of the most effective tools that you can enter into your, into your toolbox. And you use it both to offset a blast, or you can get up and, and you could just not say a word. You could put your pencil down, 
your notes, by the way, um, most negotiators know how to read backwards. So don't just think your notes aren't to be seen. Turn the page to a blank page. Please don't leave your notes out open for visibility when you go. And of course, unless you really need to write on your hand, don't they take them to the washroom. I mean, don't show that you don't know what you're doing. All right, but um, that's, that you can do by looking at your notes on your phone, right? Uh, but please don't grab your paper notes and go out of the room. But in any case, you have somebody who's, who's temper tantrum. Uh, when I ask you, where do you wanna negotiate? Tip, tip. Where do you wanna negotiate the first time? Your place or mine? I wanna be in your office. I wanna be in the place where you live. I wanna see who you are and what you have on the wall. I wanna see what your desk looks like. Now you may have cleaned it up as I do, throw everything into a box and put it in another room, but all right. I wanna see you know, who, who you know. I wanna see what's important to you. Is your family important to you? All, all the people that you shook hands with. Are there pictures of presidents and mayors? All right, is that, you know, is that who you are? Or is it a mixture? Or are you a fan of art? Because I wanna find other ways to build relationships with you. Do you like sports? What sport? All right, I am gonna to look to see if the Cubs are winning, all right? Or if the Sox are winning, if that's your team. All right, I am not a sports person and I will admit that I'm not gonna play that game, but I'm gonna show you that I listen to you. If you're a foodie, I'm gonna tell you about one of the restaurants, my favorite little dives in Chicago. And if you love Mexican food, I'm gonna tell you that I live Mexican food and we're gonna talk because we're building trust, because we're building a rapport and because we're waiting for the time when that trust as we get forward into this negotiation is gonna be most meaningful. He's still screaming at you. And there are women who do the same. You, if you're in his office, if you're in her office, you can walk out. You can't easily walk out of your own office. Sometimes, and I mean not even once a year, I come across somebody who has a reputation for being a negotiating horror all the way through the negotiation. So what I do is I make sure that I'm going to their office and I pick a fight. I know that they're gonna be screaming and yelling. Now, this is only if I can afford, my client has no deadline and has no absolute need for a deal. I pick a fight. By picking a fight, I mean, I don't tell them that they're wearing the ugliest shirt they could possibly wear, right? No, all right? I'm telling, I'm picking an area of negotiation and just say, you know what, your client's asking for this and it's it's little, you know, I'd like to talk to you about this first, it's nothing. And I do pick meaningless things, right? So that later on I can move past them. That's, you know, that's like the stupidest idea I ever saw. Why in the world would your client want something like that? And I get exactly what I want. I get this enormous explosion. And then I say, uh, can you um, bring it back to the table or are you not able to do that now? They're screaming, right? Stamping feet sometimes, throwing pencils, who knows what they're doing. And I say, uh, Ms. Jones, Mr. Jones, um, I'm gonna go back to my office now. I think, you know, we have a chance of really doing something wonderful together, but apparently not today. And definitely not when you're screaming at me ever. So call me when you're ready to deal. That call doesn't come that day. That call generally comes two or three days later. And it's usually still aggressive, but it's not the screaming aggressive that it was before. This happens on the telephone more frequently. Somehow people think that on the phone with that screen of anonymity, if they're not doing Zoom, they can be exceedingly unpleasant in order to get their way. Apparently it's a proven technique. Silence first. I used to laugh. All right. Well, that, you know, ever get angry um, and, and one of your family laughs at you when you're angry, it makes you so, so much angrier. I don't think the laughing works that much. You know, there might be a little, are, are you kidding me? Are you really yelling at me? All right. That's a little bit of that. Like, slow up your conversation. It's really hard to yell at someone who's speaking so slowly even if it's soft tone, I'm not asking him or her to come down to my tone, but that basically is, if it's a reasonable person who's lost patience, what happens? They will follow my lead down and I can start to talk a little bit faster and a little bit more definite, but I'm always watching my tone because patience is, is teachable, but not immediately. 
Patience, of course, means counting to 10, like we heard, but patience makes five deep breaths, visibly or not. That's your patience coming to the fore. Two breaths will do it for you. Controlling your patience, absolutely, absolutely you know, essential. You can't negotiate unless you can negotiate with patients through a whole day and possibly maybe two or three or four more. Patients will get you where you want to go eventually. Screaming will not. Frustration with the other side will not. But alternatives will. So I think you've all read the book, Getting to Yes, and maybe other getting to yes types of books. Um, that was the book that created the, the phrase BATNA, Best Alternative to a Negotiated Agreement. We're using that all now, you know, a lot because we are in our preparation determining what alternatives there need to be. But if you're coming to a negotiation, you should have two things. One, already creative, three or five, or five, six alternatives, three alternatives for each piece of your negotiation, because there's going to be timing, there's going to be price, there's going to be geographics, there's going to be people who you want on the other team, there's going to be all kinds of things that you can bring in. And if you do three different types of alternative and present them, the person on the other side feels like they have a choice, even if they know that this is a negotiating technique. It's a good one. It's a respectful technique. What is it of these three that you want to put together? And they're not going to take one of your one of your alternatives, and you're not going to reach a deal that moment. But what you will accomplish is seeing what's important to them. Now, they might not tell you the truth because they may not want you to know that they are on a deadline, an emergency, a cash shortage that has to be resolved today. So they may pick other things, but they're going to pick it in combinations. They're going to say, oh, well, I want that from there and that from there and that from there. So you're going to get a deal, you know, that alternative that isn't to your liking necessarily, but it's going to give you information. It's going to give you information, that kind of alternative, and always coming together with the opposite side to say, what can we do together here to make this part of our agreement, you know, go away? You know, how can we find a totally different conversation? Let's repackage this. Let's talk about this from a different way. What if you and I weren't at the table and this wasn't about um, buying a home. What if our negotiation right here on financing had to do with tuition for a university? How would we go out and get financing? Again, that we, how would we find a solution together? Always. What are your ideas? And I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm listening again. I'm listening and watching body language. I'm listening to the words that are chosen to describe the situation, to judge the emotional level, to judge the corners, all right, where there might be a place for us to slip in together and work a deal that we hadn't ever envisioned. I mean, it's not a myth that sometimes you start negotiating by sell and you end up merging. It's not a myth. Somebody walks in and says, um, I want graphics. Right? I want I want a website, I want a graphics designer, and you've got a genius graphics designer on the other side, but guess what they want? They want somebody to handle their sales. And all of a sudden, you've got a team that you didn't have before. That's why listening is so important, because it may not have been part of the negotiation to know that you needed sales. You could just say I get what you know. I get what you're going through at your office. I, you know, I'm going through my third salesperson, and or you know, my third head of sales, and I can't get somebody to build the team that I need. And they say, I've got that. And all of a sudden, you've got a new business, or the old business with a great team. So you need to be open to everything that's happening, and that's why you need to engage. You need to be curious, and you need to listen. So we've talked about using silence. Let's talk about building trust. Who does everything best in your own view? Me. I trust me. Now I know I'm not perfect, right? In fact, you know, my husband and children would tell you I am far from perfect, all right? But I trust me. I, if I'm in control, I know I can get from here to my goal. I might not get there in the usual way. I might not get there happily. And I may not get to the goal. But at least at the beginning, I'm trusting myself. So who else do I trust? I trust the person, my opposite number, 
who's more like me than I could ever want to find. If I had a PowerPoint, I would be showing you a picture of two women who are twins, two women who look alike, sound alike, have the same hairstyle, dress in the same informal style, use the same informal or very, very formal language, speak very fast or speak very slowly, like to be near each other, sitting on a bench close to each other in an office, pull up a chair and talk pre-COVID, or like personal space. That six feet away that COVID is a heaven for people who need their personal space. Nobody's trying to hug them, shake their hand, you know, give them, you know, move into their space. So you need to be, when we get back to person-to-person -person negotiation, or even when we're negotiating on Zoom, if we need to, and certainly it's difficult when we're negotiating on the phone, figure out what you can demonstrate that makes you trustable because you're so much like the person on the other side and because you've prepared and you know if they're from the South and you know if they're wearing jeans and you know if they're highly technical and detail oriented or creative and broad picture, you have learned about them. So even if you're on the phone, you can bring into the conversation and the manner in which you choose your priorities and the tone that you use and the speed at which you use it. You can bring all of that knowledge into the way in which you present your arguments, your points, your solutions, your request for input. So now, you look alike. Maybe you don't really look alike, but after you build this core relationship of dressing in a way that's comfortable for the other person to accept, remember that other person is not accepting on the outside. It's their brain working to, to determine, are you credible? Do I not want anything to do with this person? Do they, we say, rub me the wrong way, All right? Or are they somebody that could be my sister or brother and I want to do this deal? That's your brain talking to you. You want your brain involved in every part of this negotiation because that is what is negotiating. Here's one for you. We were talking about alternatives. So your job is to think about a whole bunch of alternatives and you go to sleep the night before your big negotiation starts and you've got everything spinning in your mind and you really can't come to some really great new thought to bring into the conversation and you go to sleep. What do we always hear? Sleep on it. You'll think of it in the morning. Why do we hear that? Because it's actually been proven now. We have MRIs. We know that you are going to sleep into your deepest subconscious that you will never touch. And that deep subconscious is spending its time in your deep sleep mode, connecting different areas of your brain to find facts that you forgot long ago, to find incidents and experiences that you can twist and turn into connections to solve the problem that you've got in your prefrontal cortex, conscious. You're gonna wake up and get in that shower and you're gonna say, I've got it. Oh my goodness, am I smart? I've got it. All I have to do is call Jeff and he's going to have an idea. All I have to do is bring that woman I met two months ago. All right. It, she's, she knows everything about this. Why don't I just call and ask her to help me a little bit on this? Or, oh my goodness, what about the time in the playground when that little girl pushed me around and I didn't push back? You know, how about my changing my technique for today? All right, I'm, I'm not going to wear bold, all right? I'm going to wear something I never wear. I'm going to wear black. I'm going to change this up today. But that idea, it came from me, all right? But I can't give me, the me I know, all right, credit. It came from way deep subconscious in my brain because I'm letting my brain work and I'm knowledgeable about the fact that my brain is negotiating this deal and I want to give it every bit of help I can. So you are going to prepare by figuring out about these other folks. You're gonna be preparing by finding the energy in yourself and you're gonna be preparing for being confident enough to trust yourself and build a relationship, a, common, a commonality, a smile, 
you don't have to be afraid of smiling. Guys, look at yourself right now. You're not smiling. I can guarantee you. Ah, there, I got a smile. But I'm not seeing you. I only see a few of you at the moment. All right, maybe I should try and see more of you. Uh oh, see, so you're cheating now, right? Right, okay. <laughs> so, uh, but ladies, look at your lady counterparts. They're mostly smiling. Their default expression is, all right, some of them serious, but rarely do they go through an entire negotiation without a smile. You guys, you think, you think smiling, I don't know if you think smiling's weak or smiling shows that you're having a good time or smiling shows that you're agreeing with me, but I can tell you, you're cutting me off. I don't really want to negotiate with a sour face and you want me to want to negotiate with you. That's the whole point. So if you're in a mediation, who are you negotiating with? Mediation, that would be where I come in and I go into the room with my people and the other side goes in and goes into a room with their people and Jeff comes in and he's the mediator. I'm not gonna give you mediation tips today, but this is my building relationship tip. Are you building a relationship with the mediator or the other side? Are you trying to make friends with the mediator so that you know he, he gives your visualized deal a little bit more credit than he gives to the other side that he goes in with more strength and argues on your behalf if you build a relationship with him? Well, certainly you don't want a mediator to hate you or be disgusted in some way by what you're asking. And you're gonna to listen to that mediator as he suggests possibilities. But that mediator isn't there to be your friend and to agree with you. That mediator is to position what you need in the best light to the other side without breaching your confidence, all right? Because you can always tell the mediator, I'm telling you something so that you have the whole background as to what's happening. So that from my perspective, you know the other side, but I'm asking you not to share this with them yet. The mediator is going to be pressing you on two fronts or many more, he's pressing you to tell you that your case or your position is not as perfect as you think it is, there are holes in it, all right, as he's doing to the other side, as she's doing with the other side, but he's listening to what you're saying also to figure out a way of coming to closure because a great mediator as Jeff is known to be, a great mediator is the one who either comes up with alternatives now that he's heard both sides. What would you think about? How do you feel about this alternative? Give me some feedback so I can understand where I might go. Can I share that with the other side? So don't waste your time negotiating for best positioning to the mediator. Waste your time, right? It doesn't make any sense. His job is not to love you. He comes to do a deal and bring two parties to closure in any way that he sees as possible. Closure that is a solution and is durable. Or Written we've agreement. Got two, or we've got about five minutes left. Let me ask you a question. We have viewers here from all over the world, from many different continents. This negotiating advice, does it uh, differ when you're in different countries, different cultures, or is this really universal? Some of it's very universal. You can never prepare too much. You can never listen too much. In Japan, probably no negotiation takes place initially. In Japan, everybody's listening and not talking. You want to be uncomfortable as a U.S. fast talker? You go to Japan and realize that the people who are the best at negotiating aren't saying anything. The leaders, the higher up the ladder, present at negotiation, the less they're going to talk. What are they doing? They are negotiating. They're looking at you and gathering every piece of information about you and what you say that they possibly can for good. I mean, in order to make a deal, but it's not going to happen. Patience. Patience is crucial, more important every place else than here in the United States. We are the most direct negotiators, even though I tell people that you know, so that's a style direct and, and, and upfront is really good, but you always have to leave yourself room. You have to play the game here, all right? You can't just come in and say, you know what? I'm a direct negotiator, so I'm going to tell you what my bottom line is. It never works. Women want to do that. They don't want to play the game. So guys understand that women want to do that. You could maybe press them into a deal fast. Other countries, it could take you a year. 
And some countries don't write contracts. Oh, and what is a contract in other countries? Sometimes those contracts are nothing but a loose, you think it's a signed contract and they think it's just kind of a loose outline of the way in which you're gonna do business together. Some countries are very offended by the request for a written contract. Don't you trust me, Jeff? I just shook your hand. We don't do written agreements. Then what do you do, All right? So, and of course, ways of speaking and acting and politeness vary. And that cultural meeting, that first 180 seconds of opportunity for influence, when you first meet somebody, that carries through everywhere. As long as what you've done is you've done your preparation to understand how do you open it up and show and get influence in this country? I mean, the last thing you want to do, and which I think we would all know, is for, to have me walk up to my Saudi Arabian counterpart and shake his hand. That would not <laughs> be appropriate. That would make him very, very uncomfortable. In Saudi Arabia or Arab countries, no matter how modern the business is, I've got my hands down at my side. If this is a modern person who wants to show that they're modern, and because I'm a foreigner is willing to shake my hand, they will put their hand out. So there is nothing that's known in other countries. Latin America, that's where I spend a lot of my time, totally different. You think that some countries, because we talk about bargaining on the beach, you think that they bargain you know, all the time? No, they don't. Sometimes in some ways they set a price and that's it. And that's not what you're negotiating. You're negotiating something else, how long you have to pay, right? Or what you're paying for, or what you're gonna get when you pay it. But they may not be negotiating price at all. So lots to do. All right, we have about two minutes left to go. So right. maybe, maybe it's time just for a couple of concluding remarks, please. Well, one and concluding remark is very simple. Remember, not every negotiation ends in agreement. If I were talking to you at BATNA, best alternative to a negotiating agreement, here's where I use it most. If you have identified a best alternative, sometimes the best alternative is to walk. If you can't improve on walking, then walking is the best alternative. If, of course, it is not a ploy, if, of course, you are able to walk, because walking is a risk if it's a ploy. You may never get back to the table. But walking, if you're done with the deal, is not a ploy. Walking is saying to yourself, I have come to a place where walking is the best alternative. And that, I think, might be my closing remarks in case there's a question or two that we have. That's, that's about it. Oh, yes, of course. I said be a chameleon, be unpredictable, be a different person every time you show up at the negotiating table, before lunch, after lunch, beginning coffee, go to the washroom and change your personality, all right, a little bit and see what that, that, all right, is a wonderful tool because it's not offensive. It just says, oh my goodness, what does she want in this deal? And, and who is it that I'm negotiating with? I guess I can't predict that. Maybe I have to just get to the facts and get a deal done here because I don't know who she is, except that I know that it feels like every one of those people she brought to the table is, here's the major word, Jeff, authentic. Fantastic. Laurel, you indeed over-delivered. You promised us 10 tips and there were dozens and dozens of gems in this presentation. Thank you so much. I know everybody appreciated it. And if people are able to contribute to culinarycare.org, which helps to take care of cancer patients and their families, that would be just wonderful. Hopefully we'll be hitting, our, our audiences will be hitting the $100,000 mark in terms of amounts yes. contributed to food banks. This was a great opportunity and I loved every second of it. Thank you. Are there any questions in the chat? I've asked you to um, send me an email at lbellows at belloslaw.com. I'll send you my 10 pointers and, uh, and I'll answer a question or two if you have them. So just um, send me a note, I'll be glad to help. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Natalie, Jean, thank you so much for your participation in this great webinar. Laurel, fantastic presentation, thank you so much. We'll see you next week. And with that, my friends, we are complete.